I was having a meal at my in-laws' house like usual. However, in the middle of such a meal, I was struck by an incredible sleepiness and plopped down on the dining table. In my dazed consciousness, I heard my husband's laughter, and it finally worked. Let's take her to the mattress. I tried to resist, but my consciousness faded away, and when I came to, I was lying on a hospital bed. My mother-in-law, who was attending to me, told me a shocking truth. I'm Kristen, a 26-year-old office worker. My husband Archie is also a 26-year-old office worker. We met as colleagues at work. And our similar hobbies and views on love brought us closer together, and we got married after two years of dating. I was 25 years old. During our relationship, Archie and I enjoyed snowboarding, which was a common hobby of ours. And we often went on trips, and Archie would make plans for us on those trips. I was having trouble fitting in at work at the time, but Archie comforted me about it. And thanks to him, who was such a strong ally, I was mentally supported and gradually began to fit in at work. Archie was the second son, but since my brother-in-law, the eldest son, had found a job far away from home after we got married, my parents-in-law, especially my father-in-law, started urging me to have a grandchild as soon as possible. However. We had discussed and decided not to have children until our savings reaches a target amount, and I asked Archie several times to tell him that. But his urging was there every time we saw each other. My parents-in-law's house was less than an hour's drive away, and once or twice a month, we would visit them and have dinner there. My in-laws are what you would call old-fashioned people. And my father-in-law always believed in a patriarchal household. My mother-in-law was a quiet woman, who stood quietly behind my father-in-law and took care of him. However, from my point of view, his belief was often excessive. And when something happened that he didn't like, he would be harsh with my mother-in-law, even when it had nothing to do with her. And sometimes he would yell at her unreasonably. I felt incredibly uncomfortable, but Archie did not care about this, and I had to live with the atmosphere, knowing that it was not something I, as his wife, was allowed to interfere with. On the other hand, my father was a loving husband, and he took care of my mother, and she was very grateful to him. I was quite surprised at the gap between my own parents and my parents-in-law's image of a married couple. The main cause of my unease was the fact that Archie had no doubts about his parents' relationship. On the contrary, he took advantage of my father-in-law's unreasonableness toward my mother-in-law. Mom, you are really slow. In response, my mother-in-law responded with a sad smile and said. I'm sorry. I was so pained to see my mother-in-law apologizing with a sad smile. On our way home from my parents-in-law's house, I said to Archie, "Why do you blame your mother like that when it's not her fault?" Dad worked hard to support our family, but Mom is a stay-at-home mom, and instead of giving Dad a break, she often irritates him. So she deserved to be called out like that. He said something so outrageous. By irritating him, do you mean because she didn't put the condiment in front of him on the table, and not knowing the whereabouts of his lost glasses? He's not a child. Archie wrinkled his brow. A stay-at-home mom is the one who takes care of the house, so that the husband can live at home without any problems. You work, so I don't expect you to do that much. But when we have kids. I will leave taking care of the house to you. Huh? What's that supposed to mean? Does that mean that you will not do your share of taking care of the household at all? That's impossible. When I responded with strong words like that, Archie immediately became a little upset. I'm not saying that, but 
Archie is more uptight after dealing with my father-in-law, and we often have this kind of exchange on the way home from my in-law's house. Iris is not a quiet woman like my mother-in-law, and neither my father-in-law's nor Archie's attitude was at all acceptable. So every time I would answer back, and the conversation would end. However, Archie gradually became more and more influenced by my father-in-law and began to make greater demands of me. And I would argue against it. But you will eventually stop working, right? You have to prepare for that now. Can you live on your income alone and not put up with anything from your children? No, right? Even if we both work, we might have to put up with a few things depending on how many kids we have. By the time the kids are born, my income will be higher too, right? But you tell me what to do when that happens then? Don't tell me to do all the housework now, or to visit my in-laws alone, or be a big jerk. Archie's face turned bright red at what I said, but he seems to be at a loss for words, so he cut off the conversation as if he was trying to escape. After a while, my father-in-law contacted me again. Kristen, I heard you rebelled against Archie again, didn't you? Rebelled? I only disagreed with him. We were just discussing our marriage. You are not going to produce an heir, and you are talking back to Archie, the head of your household. When are you going to have children? You talk about heirs, but I'm not going to let them take over your house even if they are born. Archie is always talking to me like you, but how can you meddle in your grown son's family and call me every time? You? Who are you talking to? My forceful rebuttal left him speechless, as it did to Archie, and in the end, he said, Enough! He hung up the phone childishly. I was still thinking naively how I could convince Archie, who had been consumed by my father-in-law's patriarchal mindset. However, my thoughts were not enough. Since my dad is eager to have an heir, Let's start having children, even though it is not our plan. I froze for a moment, not understanding what he said. No, my child is not going to be the heir of my in-laws unless he wants to be. Our savings is not yet enough, and you haven't even gotten a raise. How are you going to make a living while raising a child once I got pregnant? Archie sighs deeply in response to my answer. My parents and your parents will help us, won't they? Of course it's better to have children while you are young. Archie tries to force me to proceed with the conversation, and as expected, I was disgusted and rejected him. This led to an awkward relationship between us. I was working and earning enough money to support myself on my own. So the idea of divorcing Archie began to flicker in my mind at this time. I tried many times to discuss the divorce with Archie, but Archie at that time put his father-in-law's words before my opinion, and even if I tried to discuss the divorce with him, I could not get him to agree. When I tried to discuss with Archie, he would repeat my father-in-law's words. It was just a meaningless dialogue with him. However, we started making more visits to our in-laws, and although I really did not like them, I was following Archie with a mysterious sense of obligation that if I refused him, we might not be able to function as a couple at all. My father-in-law's sarcasm got worse every time I saw him, but on the other hand, his pressure on my mother-in-law's eased up and I managed to keep my spirits up, thinking that this was a relief at least. Christine, when are you going to become a decent wife who respects her husband? You are really unfit wife, rebelling not only against the patriarch of the family, has no heir, but also against her parents-in-law. You should really be thankful that Archie is not divorcing you. I let my father-in-law's sarcasm go by saying, yes, yes, 
but I felt that the food tasted worse than usual because of his sarcasm, and I was a little reluctant to eat. I could see that my mother-in-law was looking at me with a worried expression, but I did not pay any attention to this and continued to eat. However, as time went by, I felt my body was getting heavier and my consciousness was getting dimmer. The next moment I realized that it was a sleepness, but I couldn't stand it anymore and I fell down on a table, my whole body suddenly losing its strength. In my foggy consciousness, I desperately tried to get myself up, fearing that my father-in-law would scold me again if I didn't get up soon. But I heard Archie's laughter and my father-in-law's. Finally it worked. Let's carry her to the mattress. That's right. Go make an air quickly. I felt a chill deep inside me from their conversation. But unable to resist it, I fell into a deep sleep. When I awoke, my body was on the bed in the hospital room. In my slowly becoming conscious, I noticed my mother-in-law standing by the bed crying and apologizing to me. Kristen, thank God! You are awake! I'm so sorry! It's my fault! My fault! I couldn't understand what was going on as my mother-in-law was sobbing. But the nurses and doctors who heard her voice came to the hospital room and explained the situation on her behalf. I woke up the day after I ate the meal, and it was laced with sleeping pills. I was told that the sleeping pills were prescribed to my father-in-law at the hospital, but he and Archie had mixed them in my food. Police! I was so surprised and terrified by what the doctor had told me that I screamed out to call the police. But as if waiting for my words, the police came into the hospital room. Your mother-in-law called us and we investigated this case. The police officer interviewed me and told me about my father-in-law and Archie. He told me that they had been brought to the same hospital in a serious condition and were now hospitalized under observation and absolute bed rest. As I was getting confused by the police words, he gave me more details. It seems that Archie and my father-in-law, frustrated by my reluctance to have children, had planned to put me to sleep and then proceed. They used the sleeping pills that had been prescribed for him. The reason why I felt the food tasted bad was not because of the sarcasm of my father-in-law or Archie, but because the food was actually laced with sleeping pills. My mother-in-law, who knew about this plan, tried to persuade them to stop it, but they did not listen to her at all. She tried to tell me directly, but they prevented her from doing so. So she contacted my brother-in-law, who lived far away, and asked him to help her. On that day, he was supposed to arrive at my parents-in-law's house before us, but he was delayed due to traffic. I remember the worried look on my mother-in-law's face as she looked at me, and it made sense. But why are they both in the hospital? Grant arrived just in time to see Archie and Hank holding you and pulled you away from them. But they both got mad at him and grabbed at him. But Grant, he wrestles and that's judo. In other words, they were so angry at him for saving me, and they tried to attack him, but got injured so badly that they had to be hospitalized. However, it seems that Archie had brought out a kitchen knife against him at that time and it was a close call between self-defense and excessive self-defense. My mother-in-law kept crying during this time, holding my hand. I'm so sorry. But I was able to wake up in the hospital because of my mother-in-law's courage. Thanks to you, I was able to escape from their plan. Thank you very much. I then waited for my health to improve contacted the company and started working on my divorce from Archie. Again, my mother-in-law told me, I can only do this much, but... She gave me not only the recordings of the conversations between Archie and my father-in-law planning this matter, 
but also the recording of the sarcasm he had been hauling at me. Why? I've been talking to my eldest son about it for a while. He told me to keep the recordings in case something happens. I thanked my mother-in-law for her kindness, and at the same time, I asked her, You're not going to get a divorce? Actually, I got divorced and decided to live with my eldest son. I had resigned myself to the fact that I would have no money to live on after the divorce, but Grant said he would take care of it. My mother-in-law looked a little relieved and told me about the future. I was worried about my mother-in-law, even though we were no longer related, so I was relieved by her words. With the evidence I had received from my mother-in-law, and in consultation with my lawyer, I filed a claim for compensation, a police report, and a restraining order against Archie and my father-in-law, and left the rest to my lawyer, explaining the situation to the company and informing them of my resignation. After hearing my report, the company dismissed Archie on disciplinary grounds and proposed to transfer me to a distant branch. I gratefully accepted and was able to leave my hometown. Incidentally, since my parents had passed away early, I had no family home. This was perceived as a weakness, which encouraged Archie's and my father-in-law's attitude. Archie and my father-in-law were arrested and sentenced to prison. Naturally, his company was told about the incident and dismissed him from his job, even though he was about to retire. My mother-in-law also filed a claim for alimony against my father-in-law on the advice of my brother-in-law and so she also got divorced. They tried to borrow money from their relatives, but they did not cooperate with them. So they borrowed money from a shady financial institution to pay the alimony. The sanctions against my brother-in-law were also justified by her lawyer, and he ended up without any charges. Archie and my father-in-law lost their house and livelihood, and they tried to rely on my mother-in-law and my brother-in-law but they were rejected. And now they are living together, blaming each other and living in fear of debt collectors every day. Furthermore, my father-in-law is still suffering from the after effects of the injury he sustained. And Archie has been obliged to take care of him, which has been physically and mentally quite overwhelming for him. I have been contacted several times through my lawyer but I refused to take any action without asking him what he wanted. So the only information I have about what happened after that is what my mother-in-law, who I have been in contact with occasionally, has told me. As for me, I have begun to get used to the life in a new place, and although I suffered from a trauma so severe that I could not eat anything but my own homemade food at the beginning of the divorce, the symptoms have subsided, and I can now eat meals served by restaurants. I can't eat the food that my colleagues sometimes give me, but they all know the situation. Don't worry about it. Surrounded by such warm people, I have recovered mentally and physically, and I'm now enjoying my life alone. My mother-in-law and I have maintained a good relationship even after the divorce and we sometimes have dinner between our residents. And I have tried many times to thank my brother-in-law for all he has done for me. It was the worst incident that happened because I ran away from my parents' house and left them alone because I was too lazy to deal with them. So I would rather pay alimony to you too. But I never let him do that for me. I can't forget everything that happened, but I'm looking forward to the future and hope to recover from it in time.